entirety of Frank's life. And so some of the bones and skulls came off of the family property from um, creatures that had resided there or things that he found out walking um, along the fields and that sort of thing. There are some more exotic skulls that he ordered from scientific supply stores so um, to get sort of different silhouettes for some of his creatures. So kind of a, kind of a combination. Um, I have used bones myself in my work previously, and one of the things that you also find when you start using bones is that people then start bringing them to you. Um, and sometimes you have to get very specific about like the cleanliness of the bones or <laughs> what, the, what kind of bones you're interested in, because people just, um, like cats, just leave little offerings on your doorstep sometimes. Oh, well, I hadn't, ex hadn't expected that. So. But yeah, he gathered, he was kind of a collector of all sorts of things you can see from some of these pieces. Um, these were containers for him in different ways. So he would sometimes uh, put personal objects, mementos. Um, other times he would gather things and put them in. Um, this is some of his early work. Uh, towards the end of his life, he was making pieces that were no longer figurative, but were just these huge bundles. Um, where he was um, you know, wrapping them with rope and there would be bones and buttons and all sorts of objects and he would coat them with wax and all sorts of things. Um, some of his pieces uh, are sculptures that are currently being stored out on the family. The family has a, a pioneer barn and some of them are being stored carefully wrapped um, in the family's, uh, in the building on the family property. Um, last summer I went out and a raven had constructed a huge, huge nest above some of the sculptures. Um, and it was amazing to see that the, um, how much the textures and patterns and things of that bird's nest um, were mimicked in Frank's later work. And you can kind of see little aspects of this here. Uh, so Frank um, went to the, the Sales High School in Walla Walla. He was raised in a Catholic family. Um, after graduating, he studied, started studying to become a Jesuit priest, um, and then he fell in love with another novitiate, and as a result of that, left the priesthood. Um, he was drafted into the Vietnam War. Um, an army chaplain encountered him uh, there and found out that he had a facility with language and recommended him to a program to become an interpreter. Um, and he was very, very fortunate the day that his um, that his uh, group actually shipped out to Vietnam. He was um, moved, transferred into this language school. And then after the Vietnam War, uh, after he was discharged, um, he studied and received a degree, a master's in classical languages and Latin, and then went on to get another degree in archeology. span um, He split his life as he grew older uh, between Walla Walla and San Francisco. Um, after his mother and father passed away, he uh, was left with the management uh, along with his siblings of the family's farms. So he would live in San Francisco for three or four months and then he would come up and he had a place in Walla Walla where he would uh, come up also. Um, and when he was in Walla Walla, because his home in San Francisco was so small, he had a studio out at the airport, um, the regional airport there in the Walla Walla area. So as soon as he'd get up in the morning, he would go out to his studio and he would work until it got too hot or too cold or too dark, and then he would, then he would go back. Um, later in life, like in his 40s, uh, Frank had a lot of transitions. He came out uh, to his family when he was 40. He also went back to school and got a degree um, in, from the uh, Art Institute of San Francisco in sculpture and painting. Um, there are some of the textures and patterns in this work that were present in the work that he did in his MFA show. And one of the things that he talked about, which kind of takes me back to that raven's nest, is how evocative the textures and elements of his, uh, in his sculptures were and how they were derived from this landscape out here in eastern Washington and Oregon. Um, there were fence posts, there were bones, there were the tangle of branches that you would find in a snag along the creek. Um, you know, bits of fabric caught on a barbed wire fence, tangles of old wire, uh, wood piles, um, all these different things that from the local landscape, but he saw them and kind of put them together in these fantastic amalgamations and brought color and a different kind of light.
life and pattern to them. Um, even though Frank uh, left um, the study uh, for the priesthood, he never stopped being a spiritual person. Um, he was a student of world religions throughout his life, a uh, voracious consumer of all kinds of mythology. Um, one of the things that he was looking for in that uh, was places where all of these ancient stories uh, overlapped, places where there were commonalities. Um, he had been excluded in certain ways, and so he, what he was looking for were these points of contact where things kind of came together um, and there was room to sort of move around. Uh, he loved the ritual um, of the Catholic Church um, and the rituals of all sorts of world religions and brought that into his work. Uh, in the 1970s, um, he and a cousin took a, a, a several month trip and did a tour of, of parts of Europe, Africa, um, the Far East, and then Egypt. And when he uh, went to Egypt, um, the artwork there, the tombs, um, the history completely captivated him. And of course you can see some resonance or echoes of that uh, in the work here as well. Um, in the late, uh, mid to late 80s, um, Frank had kind of a number of tragedies around the time that some, a lot of this work was created. Uh, he was, his mother um, was struck by an automobile and um, after a number of months uh, passed away from her injuries. Um, and then uh, his, his um, most significant partner, someone that he had been with for um, you know, a, a number of years but not a, a terribly long time, um, succumbed to the, the AIDS crisis um, and passed away. Um, his partner, Eli Jose, is present in many of his drawings, and uh, he was actually an ex-penitente, which is another uh, Catholic order from the Southwest. Um, when Eli was getting close to, uh, close to death, um, he and Frank went down to the Southwest so that Eli could be close to his family. And um, it was there that Frank was impressed upon by um, celebrations like the Day of the Dead, um, that kind of iconography. Um, one of the things that he talked about as someone who was a survivor of the uh, AIDS crisis in the 80s himself was that having faced with death, faced death, having seen so many people from his community, um, you know, devastatingly sort of uh, impacted, that um, it became important for him in his work to play with that tension between life and death, to sort of make a friend with death in certain ways, um, to provoke it at certain times. Um, and there is a lot of that in his work, where he has taken these really vibrant colors and apply them to images that were they in darker tones would become uh, even more uh, sort of um, impactful than they are um, in the palette that he's working with them. So, uh, yes. Um, there was an article, he did a, a performance piece, he did some performance work in the early uh, 80s after, he, after getting his degree. He tried to do some performance work actually out on family property here in the early 90s. And unfortunately, um, that started rumors among um, some of the neighbors that uh, the family was actually involved with the dark arts. <laughs> and it was really, it was art, but it was performance art that they were doing. Uh, um, but, uh, oh, but within the piece that he did, there was a piece that he did in Palo Alto, uh, California. Um, and there was an article that was written about it, and it was called The Beast of Summer because it had some of these pieces in it. Um, so it seemed kind of fun to sort of bring that title back to this exhibition. And that was sort of um, where part of this, uh, the inspiration for this particular vignette of Frank's work started. Um, Frank also was very much a dog person. Um, as long as I knew him, he always had a, an English bull mastiff, uh, uh, a bull terrier that was his constant companion. Um, first there was Max, and then there was Johnny. And he made lots of jokes about Frankie and Johnny. Um, and then there was uh, Princess Anne, was, the, was, was his, last, um, his last companion before he passed away. Um, 
So we thought for the dog days of summer, it would be nice to also bring out um, that component of his work as well, uh, to kind of, again, play with these sorts of tensions between the light and the dark, um, you know, the joyful and the more pensive, um, the uh, grotesque, and then um, the beautiful, right? That's, he, he liked to play with those tensions. Um, and that's the, that's the show. I have to um, extend my tremendous gratitude to Roberta uh, for allowing us to, to have this space. Um, the work just, it sings in here, the color of the walls, the lights, everything, breathes a light into this work that I haven't seen um, in other spaces. Uh, I also would like to thank, um, I don't see him here, but uh, Kyle Bond, who is one of my friends, uh, an artist and who works at the Wall Wall Foundry, who was kind enough to help me load all of this stuff up, uh, carefully strap it in to a U-Haul truck, and then help me unload it once we, once we got here. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much for um, welcoming us into your community and allowing Frank's work to um, continue to live on um, past him. She had been raised because that had always been home. And she really wanted one of her grandchildren to go to Whitney. Um, and we didn't want to, to be honest. But I thought I, thought I would take one for the team. Um, and I moved over here in the 90s to go to school. They also offered me a lot of scholarship. Um, but she um, had come from the, had also come from the Bay Area. She was a tremendous fan of art. Um, and uh, and Frank Munz actually lived down the hall from her at the Whitman Towers. Um, and I, when I came to Whitman, I also left a theological school uh, for, for reasons akin um, and decided to do something else um, and found art. And it transformed my, transformed my life, it saved my life in, in, in multiple instances. instances. Um, and so she said, there's this artist that lives down the hall, you have to meet him. I met Frank, um, you know, then as uh, someone in my early 20s, and he had a show at WSU and invited me to, encouraged me to go and take a look at his work. Um, and I did, um, which was kind of out of, my, out of my nature. It was actually the first fine art exhibition that I'd ever been to. I drove over to Pullman uh, to see it. And um, I came from a family that, uh, outside of my grandmother, there wasn't a big appreciation for, uh, for fine art. Certainly not as something that you want to spend your life <laughs> pursuing in any significant way. Um, and when I walked into that space and saw his work, uh, there was an energetic resonance. And I saw a visual language that I had not ever been exposed to but that made a lot of sense to me and connected on some very deep levels. And so it had a profound impact uh, on my own work as a student. And we kind of lost touch after that. And then over time, he showed at the Sheehan Gallery and I was working there as a, um, as a gallery assistant. And we developed a rapport. And then after that, we started, uh, when he was in town, I would go out to his studio and we'd look at his work, talk at his work, watch him um, paint. Uh, his mature work actually was really beautiful. He continued to do a performance, but it was like a private performance that he did in his studio. This movement of back and forth, um, drawing marks on uh, the paper and then sort of serving as a conduit and allowing kind of creatures and other forms to emerge. So again, different from this where he was using his sculptures as his models. Um, the last time that I actually saw him, I had gone out to his studio and I was going to start cataloging his work. And we had a conversation because he was like, I'm getting older, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this stuff, um, but it feels like I should do something. And like, like so often, we started having <coughs> a conversation and um, it just turned into a conversation. And uh, 
you know, we're talking and he said, well, next time when I come back to Walla Walla, I'll be back to Walla Walla, like four to six weeks, and we'll just hit it hard and get in there and start, start this uh, going. And, um, and two days after he was back in California, he was gone. So uh, we never got to finish having that conversation. Uh, so, I feel very privileged to be able to continue to work with him. In some ways, um, you know, because Frank was a trickster, and you can see that trickster energy in these pieces in a lot of ways. I think that, that maybe um, he wouldn't have minded, because he doesn't, you know, he, he didn't necessarily like to over explain what he was doing, or a lot of artists don't. He more wanted people to just experience his pieces and have their own, tie their own history to them. Um, yeah, one of the things which I loved about him, I, and I mentioned this earlier in a conversation, was he was like, love my work or hate it, just don't be indifferent to it. That's all I ask. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. Any other questions? And Daniel will be here to answer questions one-on-one -on -one as we'll pull him downstairs. So, um, the, the uh, bar is stopped and there's so good luck. So thank you so much for coming and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.